Leaders of the six East African community nations want to increase trade and reduce costs of transport and goods to the coastal cities. Road and rail network projects across the region to interlink the countries are ongoing, but leaders say they would like to see work more faster. The countries have already realized one-stop border posts to enable speedy clearance of goods and services moving within the region. They hope to mobilize money by attracting foreign investment. We are not only talking about raising the money through domestic revenues, but we are talking about private-public partnerships. In other words, uh, making it possible for the private sector to participate. The countries are aiming towards a seamless railway line and hope to lower time and costs of doing business across the region. Kenya is ahead of other states on the construction of its part of the railway, with 70% work completed. The leaders have also agreed on enhancing the construction of oil and gas pipelines and refineries. The ESC states have discovered oil and gas reserves and are working together to see production start. The environment is conducive and we shall make it even more conducive because I believe that we must uh, try to uh, mitigate the risk. Private sector is about uh, making profits and making money, but you must mitigate the risk. And those are instruments that the governments can put in place to be able to attract private sector investment. Their plans are to build interlinking oil pipelines to the port of Tanga in TZ and Mombasa in Kenya. The ESC government say their aim is to realize regional integration. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN, Kampala. Let's discuss this further with Africa Kiza, a program officer at the Southern and Eastern African Trade, Information and Negotiations Institute. He joins us live from Kampala. Kiza, welcome once again to the show. Now, the U.S. has been keen on the outcome of the discussions in Uganda with regards to the ban on importation of used clothes. Has there been a change of heart from Rwanda, Uganda and Tanzania? What's their position? Uh, thank you, Penna. Uh, no, there hasn't been any change of plans. Uh, both the countries remain committed to phase out the importation of second-hand clothes, and they are committed to give uh, East Africans choices for better quality textile and footwear products. So the status quo has been maintained in the, as per the summit. Well, Kiza, can these countries afford to lose out on the AGOA opportunities? What are the consequences of being locked out by the U.S.? Yes, uh, there are some short-term losses, which are, of course, bound to happen, but they are going to be uh, overtaken by the long-term gains. What am I saying? For example, uh, there are many people that are being employed in the trade in selling of second-hand clothes and the revenue shortfalls that are going to happen if we impose such a ban. But you look, if you look at the global statistics, for example, Uganda's import bill for second-hand clothes is $888 million U.S. million. Now, for the USA, Uganda's import bill for second-hand clothes from the USA is $444 million U.S. million. It means that if we were able to impose a phasing out of second-hand clothes, we would have $888 million U.S. million remaining in the economy. That would mean a lot. And for example, on the Agoa market, which we might maybe get locked out, our share of Agoa as Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda is only 43 million US dollars per year, while the USA for the share of the Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwandan market is 283 million US dollars per year. So you find that Uganda and Kenya, and, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda are not benefiting a lot from Agoa, and the USA is benefiting a lot. So it is important that we take an opportunity to be able to forego the mega share we have under Agoa and develop our textile and leather industries. Right. So speaking about developing the textile industries, the plan, of course, by these countries is to impose a total ban on these second-hand imports by next year. But do these countries have the capacity to fill the gap? Yes, Penna, there are some capacities. Let me give an example of Rwanda. Rwanda currently, it, there is C, C and H Industries, uh, which is a Chinese-owned uh, industry, which is now producing police uniforms, 
uh, safety vests. It is also producing athletic and the designer uh, clothes. Uh, if you go to Tanzania, we have two factories, for example, Muzavo Industries, which is producing a lot of products under the, under, uh, for, uh, in, in, in Tanzania. For Uganda, we have also entered into a Turkish industry called Sub-Saharan Africa Investments, and it has so far injected 100 million US dollars in Uganda to be able to develop the cotton sector. So uh, there are very effort, efforts that are ongoing. We have put in place strategies, uh, go, uh, rather second-hand uh, leather strategies, take cotton textile strategies, which are going to help us to develop the, co the cotton industries, to develop the cotton sector, but also to be able to develop our capacities to generate uh, local production and competition afterwards. So yes, there are strategies which are ongoing, policies and frameworks which have been put in place, but also organizing and mobilizing of farmers, especially in the cotton sector, has been ongoing. So we believe that by the time uh, we impose this ban, there are some capacities domestically which have been, have been developed and we'll be able to undertake uh, the production sustainably of, of, of growth in the East African market. All right, Africa Keys are live for us in Kampala. Always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you.